Thank you. This is the Big Bang. This is the cosmos. This is our sun. This is our earth. These are some creatures that came on our earth before us. These are some creatures that live with us. This is us. This is our brain. And these are some things that our brains can create. Today, I'd like to talk to you about wonder. For me, I think it's important to maintain a sense of wonder as we move through our lives. And for me, the deepest sense of wonder comes when I'm looking at the world through the lens of science. So I believe the best thing that we can do with each other to maintain a sense of wonder is an op open up the lines of communication between scientists and non-scientists. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm also gonna share some examples from research that really make me go, wow. And I'm also gonna discuss a little bit about science communication. So a little bit about myself. <laughs> I started my career in journalism. Um, I took that at Mount Royal College in Calgary, and at the first, in my first year, I had to choose a beat. Was I going to write about politics, sports, arts? As I was moving through the list, I realized science was the best fit for me. It made sense. I grew up with Owl Magazine, <laughs> the Magic School Bus, <laughs> and I've always had a collection of rocks. <laughs> So I finished, I finished school in Calgary, and then I moved out here to Vancouver. At Vancouver, I'm here at UBC as a part-time student, and I'm upgrading my college degree to a university degree, and I'm also working full-time at Triumph. Now, for those of you who don't know, Triumph is a, physics, it was a physics lab here on UBC campus. At any given time, there are about 500 people on site. 150 of those are researchers and students from around the world. Now, What's interesting about Triumph is that I get the chance to talk to, 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 to scientists all day long. And something that I've noticed, something that's kept with me through my journey is science communication. When I was in journalism, it was I was always so excited when I came back from interviews because talking to scientists, they give away so much enthusiasm. They just love what they do. And that's what kept me going. I really wanted to share with everyone that enthusiasm that I felt when I was talking to the scientists. Once you get them going, they just don't stop. They keep going. It's fantastic. <laughs> so now I'm going, to share, I'm going to share three examples with you today from research, things that really just make me go, wow. First thing I'm going to talk to you about is origami. <laughs> I've always loved doing origami. I've done it ever since I was little. I found it really interesting because it's, it's puzzles that you have to do. Now, as, I was, as I'm doing more intricate pieces and I'm picking up different books, I'm realizing that the books are filled with just as much math as they are patterns. Now, the mathematicians in the room, I'm sure you're able to find some elegance in this. This is one of the pieces of math that go along with origami. For the rest of us, we need a little bit of help. So the next slide that I'm going to show you is a little video, and it's going to show you how this equation can actually come alive in origami. So you take a piece of paper, I'm going to try this, there we go, we take a piece of paper and you make a mark in the middle at the bottom and you take the edges of the paper and you match it up with that mark on the bottom. You create a series of straight lines, but when it's all done, there's a shape that emerges and it's a parabola. <laughs> I think it's amazing that that can turn into that. That is fantastic. <laughs> the next example that I'd like to share with you is teleportation. Now, did you know that teleportation is real? It's actually real. They can do it. Uh, the interesting, the, the researchers that do this use some really interesting machines. <laughs> well, maybe not that. What they actually use looks a lot more like this. The way that teleportation works right now is that they're able to transfer one single atom. So they take the information from one single atom, they copy all of that information over, and then they transfer that information over here. On the quantum level, which is really, 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 really small, transferring the information or actually transferring the atom through physical space is indistinguishable. It's the same thing. Now, if we were to do this with humans, because I know everyone wants to know if it's possible, <laughs> Right now, um, if we were to do it with humans, the human body has about 10 to the 23 atoms. About. 
Um, so it's a lot of information to copy over. And the other side of things is that right now, one atom takes about 10 minutes to transfer over. <laughs> if we were to transfer all of those, that, that information, it would take longer than the age of our universe. <laughs> So a little out of reach right now, but it's really exciting that it is possible with one single atom. The last thing I'd like to share with you is how our, mem how our brains form memories. Now conventionally, it was thought that our brains are like filing cabinets. You experience something, you create a memory, and that memory goes blocked away into a filing cabinet. And every time you go back to experience that memory, it's the same memory because it's been locked away in that filing cabinet. Well, that convention is wrong. The way that it actually works, the researchers are finding, is that when you experience something, your brain fires a whole bunch of a collection of synapses. The next time that you go back and remember that experience, those same synapses fire. But just before your brain has collected itself into that memory, the brain is quite malleable. So what that means is that when you go back and experience that, there's the opportunity for the brain to change that memory just a little bit every time that you use it. So to look at it a different way, let's say you had a twin sister. Now, when you were younger, one of the biggest experiences that you had was when you've got your first piece of candy. Now, your twin sister hasn't really thought about this very much over the years, and she remembers that your first piece of candy was a lollipop. You, on the other hand, you have a sweet tooth. And you think about this, you've thought about this a lot. And over the years, you've used this memory, and now you think that the first piece of candy that you had was candy apples. They're pretty similar. They're round, they're red, they're on sticks. But because you've had the opportunity to use that memory a number of times, it's actually changed quite a bit over the years. It's a lot different than what we thought initially. And I think it's really interesting that research is able to open that up to us, that what we thought, how, how we thought it was working is maybe not actually the case. Now, when I was researching these examples, for this example in particular, I was looking through some papers. This is one of the papers that I came across. The title, Synapse-Specific Reconsolidation of Distinct Fear Memories in the Lateral Amygdala. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't really elicit the same sense of wonder as if we were going to talk about it this way. <laughs> so, it's really interesting because there's, you know, we can unlock the wonder in this. And there's already a number of ways that I've shared with you that we can do this. We can use images. We can use examples and stories. And we can question our beliefs and see if they're true or not. Now, I think the last, piece, the last piece of the puzzle is to ask questions. For me, it's the most exciting thing when we're asking questions. Now that I'm at Triumph, when I introduce myself, I say, hi, my name is Jennifer. I work at Triumph. It's a physics lab. And I leave it at that. I don't say I'm in communications. I don't say I don't have a science background. I just leave it at that. Most people will go, Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I don't really know how to respond. The brave ones get a few questions in, but I also notice right before they're able to ask that question that, what do they actually do there? What is the science that actually happens there? They don't actually ask that question. Now, I've been on that side of things, and I know that when I was first talking to researchers, this was something that I had to get over. It's the fact that, you know, I felt that I was going to be sounding really silly if I was going to ask those questions. I was thought that I would sound uneducated, unknowledgeable, if I didn't know what the research, researcher was talking about. But as the years have gone by and I've been talking to more researchers, I realize that they have to ask the silly questions just as much as we do. It's the nature of research. Fields get really, really specific. And even if you're not part of that field specifically, you're not going to be able to share those ideas well unless you're using tools like this, pictures, analogies, stories. So I think that's the part that we can share amongst ourselves. Now, the last thing that I'd like to share, do with you before I finish my talk today is I'd like to challenge you. Uh, it's a really, really simple challenge because I really believe that small actions can create change. So there's two steps that I'd like to do with you. First thing, now I need everyone in the audience to participate to make this work, but it's really simple. First off, I'd like all of the non-scientists in the room to raise your hand. Fantastic. Now, right, put your hands down. And I'd like the scientists and the non-scientists in training to raise your hands. 
That's great. Okay. Now what I'd like you to do is if you're, sitting if you're a scientist sitting beside a non-scientist or vice versa, turn to that person and exchange names with them. You can go ahead and do that. <laughs> later, take a moment and remember the name of that person you just met. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Now my challenge to you is later today at lunch break, on the next break, at the end of the talks today, start a conversation with that person. Non-scientist, ask those silly questions. And the scientist, if we get to the point where we're not really asking any more questions, use those analogies because I know you're really good at it. You have to communicate what you do to many different people and I know you can use those analogies. So with that, that is the small action that's going to create change. And now that we're all working towards opening up the lines of communication between scientists and non-scientists, we're all free to discover the wonder. So enjoy your conversations today, and thank you for being a fantastic audience.